Yeah, what to do? Om Gyan Timanandasya Gyanandana Salakya Sakshur Mitam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurve Nama Sri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Jena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Radhati Swaha Padantikam Vande Hom Sigaro Si Yuta Pada Kamalam Si Guru Vaishnam Scha Si Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chitanya Devam Si Radha Krishna Padam Sagana Lalita Sivizakam Vitam Sita He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagat Pate Gopesa Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namaste Tata Kanshan Gorangi Radha Vindavaneshwari Visabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Priye Vanchaka Pataru Gyacha Kripa Sindhu Vyacha Patitanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavya Namadana Sri Krishna Chaitanya Pravodi Chana Sri Advaita Gada Sri Vasani Gora Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I will, I will ask once more. You might have the Fatalim note in from England to Netherlands. Ja, als als. Als, als iemand niet, echt niet goed Engels begrijpt, is het geen schande. Dan is het gewoon beter om achterin te zitten, want daar is een goede Nederlandse vertaling. En, uh, ja. It's alright, it's okay as it is. Saptieke. Alles goed. Waarom niet? So, um, Vancha Kalpa Tirubhya Cha, Kripa Sindhubhya Eva Cha, Patitano, Pavanevio, Vaisnavevio, Namonamaha. Een Vaisnava. Een Vaisnava is als een wensbol die alle... Oh, I'm speaking Dutch. <laughs> Sorry. A Vaishnava is, because I always speak Dutch here, yeah. a Vaishnava is like a wish-fulfilling desire tree who can fulfill the desires of everyone. It is like that. Described by our Acharyas. Who is a Vaishnava? Um, a Vaishnava is a rare personality. The Bhagavad Gita says Manushyanam Sahasvesu Kaschit Yatati Siddhaye Yatatam Api Siddhanam Kaschit Mam Tidviditatvataha Know this to be the truth that out of many many thousands amongst men and out of there is one who strives for perfection and out of those who strive for perfection Hardly one knows me in truth. Oh. That's a Vaishnava. So a Vaishnava is a devotee of Krishna or Vishnu. Oh. Vishnu is a direct expansion of Krishna. So and um, Krishna 
is one Supreme Lord. There is one, according to the, the Vedic scriptures, not many. And although in India, if you go to India, I don't know if anyone went, but if you go with so many temples, so many pujas, I mean, it's just on every street corner and in between there is a temple. Uh, always, in the night, there is always people walking around, worshipping everywhere in India. And that spirit is so strong. Uh, now it is the time for Kumbha Mela. Mm -hmm. It's a special time because Kumbha Mela is, a, uh, is still the largest gathering of people in the world. And, uh, there is no gathering in the world where so many people come together as, as in the Kumbha Mela. So, in, in one month, maybe, there will be three or four main bathing days and over 20 million people uh, will take their bath and many of them all together, millions all together. It's elbows and pushing, a few drown on the way, but that's all part of the ecstasy, ecstasy. Huh? Very nice. That's all. So much good fortune. <laughs> uh, in Ganga, in Ganga. <laughs> At the time of Kumbo. <laughs> so nice. Anyway, India is very transcendental in that way. Then they have a very spiritual vision. And uh, it is deeply ingrained, deeply ingrained into the mentality of the people. Why? Why is it so? Um, it is so. Um, because not a blade of grass moves by chance. Maya jakshena prapite suyate sachara charam hitra nina kunti ajakati parivrattate. Again, the Bhagavad Gita. It says that everything in the universe is actually under control, control of the Supreme Lord. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? It's very much under control, I am sure. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what thing no. you are talking about. That's okay. But it's not under control of the Supreme Lord by a computer or something. Yeah. Control R and it rains, control S sunshine. Or double S maybe. And various commands like that. No, it's not going on in that way. Um, it simply goes on by his desire by his will. Oh. He desires, if you're not quiet, then it, then, then you better sit in the other room because, you know, we are all trying to have an interaction. Please, you know, it's, it's okay. Relax. We're friends, really. But, okay, today I'm giving the talk, another time you can give the talk. I'm not trying to confrontational but it's, in, keep on talking, it's impossible if you interrupt serious I'm serious okay I'm not a person to fool around with you know we just politely ask you to go away if you if you're not cool it you understand okay please go away should I ask someone to really you know otherwise we're gonna just all ask you to go away There's no game, just cool it. So, um, yeah. Anyway, so those who have faith, those who have faith that everything is under the control of the Supreme Lord will take their birth in a place where that faith is predominant. Those who don't have faith in that will take their birth in a place where that faith is not predominant. Very simple. Therefore, India is a place where there is, is, is a very strong faith. A faith that is practically not broken by whatever happens. For example, we, um, at the time of the tsunami, um, it was a big thing in the whole world, tsunami, the whole world was just shocked and so many people were, were uh, affected and, and 
died and um, also India uh, to a lesser extent than some other places but still in India 7,000 people died right? that was a lot of people right? and uh, it was an international uh, alarm situation, an emergency, and all the countries of the world, United Nations, were sending in help. And India said, it's okay, it's okay. We can deal with this, right? We can deal with it. Meaning, we've dealt with it before, we've dealt with it so many times. We can deal with it because the people can take any calamity and they will ultimately answer to it with faith. <coughs> Ultimately, they will, they will see. Yeah, that's how they see it. There is a supreme control. Yeah. Others may have another experience in another country. Um, but actually, we take our birth according to our consciousness. Our consciousness brings us to a place um, where there are like-minded people, like-minded parents, so to speak. Uh, when man and woman unite and it's the time for conception, they attract a soul who is of like-minded consciousness and who fits in that place. And so you get a national mentality. Uh, and, uh, well, we know all about nationalism, so I won't get into that. Then, Somehow or other, um, then there are saintly people in the world. Uh, saintly people who are not just pious, who have not just taken birth in a pious place or not, but saintly people. And they are found everywhere. Uh, history has its saintly people. It's, it's people who have sacrificed. It's people who have shown um, deep, deep spiritual realization. Um, I often mention, uh, from time to time at least, I make, mention about Carl Jung who was interviewed and in the interview they asked him, um, Mr. Jung, do you believe in God? And Jung said no. It was a bit of a shock because he had a very religious reputation. Uh, so Jung says no. I don't believe in God. And he's silent. And the interviewer also, because he expected yes, and then he was going to ask his next question, which he had nicely prepared. And suddenly he says, no, right? I don't believe in God. And then, so the interviewer was quiet for 10 seconds, didn't know what to say. And then Jung said, I know that God exists. So that's, that's interesting. Because it speaks about realization. It, it doesn't speak about belief. It speaks about experience and realization. Uh, so does the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita speaks about Jnana and Vigyana. In Jnana, we may have a philosophical idea. There must be something out there, logically speaking. Logically, if you think about it. How can all this come about by chance? No, I don't think that is possible. Such complexities. Uh, logically speaking, there must be something, possibly a higher plan, logically, considering. The philosopher, the jnani, might say, and his faith is based on such logic and reason. Um, but Vigyan is something else. Vigyan is described as knowing, as an experience, as the transcendental experience. Oh. The Bhagavad Gita explains the secret. Naham prakasa sarvasa yoga maya samavritaha. It is said that avrita means covered, covered. Avrita, the consciousness is covered. The consciousness is covered. The Supreme Lord keeps himself covered. Yeah. And the, the materialist cannot see him. Uh, in Bengali, 
Uh, while looking, uh, while looking, he cannot see, uh, just as the owl cannot see the sun, because his eyes are meant for the night. So, well, the Vaishnava um, is one who knows, but not only one who knows. Uh, knowing, believing is one level. Knowing is another level, uh, but knowing is not enough. Uh, it is not enough. Because it is said, Balavan Indriyan Gramo Vidvam Samapi Kersati, that the senses are so strong that even one who knows, Vidvam Sam, even one who knows, Prakriti Stani Kersati, will also struggle with prakriti, with the material energy. <coughs> huh? And isn't it like that? We know. We know. Yes, yes, I know. I know. But then, still struggling. Uh, because this, the, sometimes the material energy is creating temporary attraction, and we know it's not worth it, but uh, the senses are so, so attracted that one anyway acts upon it. That is the nature of the conditioned soul. So even one who knows <coughs> may be weak. Therefore a Vaishnava is not just one who believes, not just one who knows. A Vaishnava is one who loves. He loves. A Vaishnava is one who loves Krishna. Yes. Who loves Krishna. And with that also everyone else uh, and has everyone's best interest in mind. That's a Vaishnava. Mm. Prabhupada was a Vaishnava, a, a pure Vaishnava, a most exalted Vaishnava, who created Vaishnavas. Uh, that was because a Vaishnava uh, is a pure devotee of Krishna who can create devotees uh, of Krishna. And, and that's really uh, why, why the Vaishnavas are described as vanchakalpataru, uh, wish-fulfilling desire trees. Mm. So, somehow or other, it is through a person, uh, through a person that, that we ourselves uh, develop our faith. Yeah. It, we can read a book, yeah. and of course there's a person behind the book also. But a person makes all the difference. Huh? Yeah, uh, I had... I had grown up 20 kilometers, 25 kilometers outside of Amsterdam. And um, my, yeah, my family, they were about, uh, in 1940, they were 20. So in 1945, 25, just graduated, just ready you know, to take on the world. And the world was destroyed. The world had just, the economy had suffered from the world war, and everything was just uh, totally collapsed, and the Netherlands were strongly affected, you know. And then, uh, so they were the generation, the generation that was supposed to do it, you know, supposed to rebuild the nation. And they did it, you know, they did it. Like, by the end of the 50s, it really went a lot better. And by, um, by 1965, uh, maybe, no, earlier, 63, 63. In 1963, 
the Netherlands began to really recover and catch up. They began to catch up with, uh, with America. Oh yes, and yes, yes, this catch up with America was a big thing, right? And then, we also, then in our street, the first television came. I was 10 years old. Wow, that was big time. <coughs> All the kids, we marched on that house. I remember that day. We didn't care. You know? We were not invited. We invited ourselves. <laughs> all of us. And we had not organized it. We all knew we are going there. So we were just going there and went in. And it was all right. They gave us lemonade and cookies. <laughs> and the TV. And we thought, and we, we liked it. And we knew we were coming back. <laughs> and then, uh, about a year later, everyone in the street had a television. Everyone. Uh, that's how it was. Everyone had a television. And we started to have a fridge and so many other, all these modern things, just like in America. Yeah. So, um, what can be said? Um, um, and my parents, they were very, very proud, you know, like, uh, naturally, of their success, uh, of having created such a nice, uh, well, and made so much progress. Uh, and, uh, and then they said, yes, we've done it all for you, my dear children. And we, we were the ungrateful generation. We said, but we never asked for this. Right? And saying, money can't buy you love. <laughs> and all these things. Right? And in this way, there were, the generation gap was, became a reality. Um, we faced it like that. And, and within that atmosphere, um, uh, a few years later, the Beatles came, and uh, no self-respecting young men went to the barber again. Barbers <laughs> went out of business overnight. <laughs> <laughs> Finished. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That was it. You know, that was a crisis, economic crisis for barbers, <laughs> due to the Beatles. Whatever it was, but uh, whatever there, there happened was, um, there certainly was a lot of uh, external things, but also a lot of people who were looking for something. Mm. I wound up in India, overland, um, long journey. And in India, uh, became overwhelmed by the strong faith of the people at large. And I could see uh, there is saintliness in this country, absolutely. Yeah. More than, than commonly is available, I was thinking, in, in my own country. So in this way, uh, India captured my heart. and. Uh, I stayed as long as I could on my visa and then went back and then just made some money, turned around and went back to India, again overland, all up and down overland. <laughs> Long trip. <laughs> lots of mountains, lots of valleys, lots of dry riverbeds, lots of crazy places, the Khyber Pass where you can buy any weapon off the shelf, that is to say any machine gun, bazooka or anything like that you buy off the shelf. A tank you have to order, that takes one week. <laughs> <laughs> and to walk around with straps of bullets, and it was the Wild East. <laughs> and I felt naked without, you know, those six shooters. Anyway. So many material adventures, but uh, but I was not disappointed um, because the spiritual depth, the spiritual depth that that I was looking for, that I had felt 
that was lacking, that was lacking in, in the Western society, that had become so materialistic in response to the, the collapsed economy, that economy was everything, and where was spirituality? It was there, but on the decline. But there in India, it was so strong and so alive. Anyway, gradually, um, gradually, after quite some years in that environment, um, I slowly began to see um, why Krishna, why one God. Uh, hmm. Why there's a God in the first place that I began to see? Second, I began to see why one, yeah. and uh, yeah. But I only really saw it through the mercy of the Vaishnava. Oh. So this is how it works. Oh. One may, on his own, one may on his own develop a spiritual inclination. One may on his own. Um, search out some truth. Of course, that on our own is also due to our previous activity. Because life after life we are in this world to fulfill desires. And according to these desires, we are born in the next life when our desires in our early childhood are still a little bit covered. Uh, but they come out, even in children, comes out. So many things come out, and as they're getting older, more and more comes out. Uh, all these desires come out once again, and we pick up the thread where we left off. And once again, we begin in uh, trying to fulfill the desires that we could not fulfill in the last life. And we feel it so strong, I must do this, I must have it, I must. Oh, is it worth it? Is it, oh, I give everything for this. Why? Because I feel it, so what? You know, does it make sense? No. Feelings are nice. Because in the end, it's about feelings. But in the beginning, we have to purify the feelings. Now, we cannot just run after our feelings first. Feelings must be purified. A Vaishnava is one whose desires have been purified, whose all desires are now focused on one. He has said, He is one-pointed. He has become one-pointed in his focus. Not here, there. Oh, what's that? Let's try that. Oh, try this. Life is such a beautiful adventure. <laughs> Life is such a beautiful adventure. <laughs> So time moves along, and we're playing, but are we making progress? Where are we going? What are we attaining? What is life for? Uh, Prabhupada, our, our guru, um, was walking through, the, uh, through a city, and he came <coughs> past a children's playground, and there was a sign, and it said, children's fairyland. And he walked past, then he turned around, pointed his cane at the skyscrapers that were in the center of that city, and said, Adults Fairyland. <laughs> <laughs> so, very interesting how, how we are playing. A small, little kite, big, get a hand glider, you know, small, Play with a dinky toy later on, you know, you know, huh? and like you know, girls have dolls. 
Um, and then, there it is. So, <laughs> nice, yes. But, is that the all in all? No, it's not. Um, the Bhagavad Gita immediately uh, comes out with in this, the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is is a description of is an introduction really Krishna Arjuna is an introduction, but in the second chapter, uh, uh, a serious discussion begins, and immediately uh, the the first thing that is established is the eternity of the soul. The soul never dies, the soul never takes birth, and so on. So the eternity of the soul, the eternity of our existence is emphasized in the Bhagavad Gita in the beginning. And, and that's the underlying principle. So the Bhagavad Gita points out, whatever you do in the temporary, yes, 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 that must be done. Yes, that is good. But whatever you do, must not only give benefit in the temporary situation, but simultaneously also help you to progress towards the eternal situation. That's the proper way to act. It's both. Both goals simultaneously. Not only give up the world. Uh, no, not only <coughs> come to my cave uh, and meditate in my cave and just give up the world. No. Stay in the world, and stay in the world, and uh, be happy in the world, but at, in such a way that we're also etern attaining the eternal goal. So that our, our happy, whatever kind of happiness interferes with that eternal goal, that kind of happiness can't have. Therefore, a stake is they put too much at stake. You know, when you eat a stake. Uh, because you lose your eternal benefit. And so many other things. We lose our eternal benefit. That's the point. So, um, a Vaishnava is one who is always living in this way. Never ever. Uh, oh, a Vaishnava is comfortable. Mm. But a Vaishnava at the same time knows you cannot always be comfortable. Some, you know, some some hardships will come in the world, you have to tolerate. It's the way the cookie crumbles, as they say. You know. uh, that's an American proverb. Mm. So what can we do? The um, Vaishnava, the Vaishnava is is also understanding that Krishna is not only the supreme controller, uh, like I said before, but that he is also the well-wisher of all living beings. It is said, Sarva Loka Maheshwaram, he is the controller of all the planetary systems, all living beings. And it is said, Suridam Sarva Dehinam, he is the friend of all embodied beings, all, all living beings, human beings, plants, animals, all, all embodied beings. He's the friend and well-wisher of all of them. So, the Vaishnava understands his position. He knows that he is not the master. A Vaishnava knows that he is a servant. Everyone is a servant. You know, you can't get around it. Right? it uh, you always have to serve someone. That's just the nature it is. Yes, boss, uh -huh, boss, very nice boss. Or, you know, um, or the voters, you know. And I promise. <laughs> yes, you and, yes, I can. And the voters, uh, the voters. So in this way. Always trying to cater to others, trying to, one has to serve, mother has to serve, child, so much, 
sacrifice for that child. Constant attention when they're small. When I look at it sometimes, I go, oh my God, good that I have no hairs. <laughs> so, um, not easy. We all serve. Yes. Vai a Vaishnava serves Krishna, the Supreme Lord, but not only. <coughs> Not that he turns away from the world alone with God, me and my God, and my God and me. Picture on Facebook, you know. <laughs> Picture on Facebook, me and my God, my God and me, and Vaishnava is the is the face is the is the Facebook page called. Yeah, you can check it out. <laughs> no, no, not like that, you know. A Vaishnava is, is understanding, is automatically acting as an instrument of the Supreme Lord and is therefore also the well-wisher of all living beings. All of them. <coughs> that's a lot, eh? That's a lot of living beings, if you think about it. And that's complicated. So to be a Vaishnava is quite a platform. Uh, to be the well-wisher of all living beings, not so small. Not such a small thing. Uh, uh, because, how do you do it? Uh, but, okay, the Bhagavad Gita points out, you can only be a real well-wisher if you um, look after people's eternal interest. And the eternal interest is their eternal relationship with the Supreme Lord. Therefore, a Vaishnava is interested in, in again, restoring in the world um, the eternal relationship that all living beings naturally have with the Supreme Lord. And yeah, you know, like, okay, then I, I, I am from Holland, and many of you here are from Holland, and um, yeah, uh, in many parts of Holland, religion is not so in the foreground, you know, in some parts more than others. Um, in this, this, part, you know, the western part, not so much. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, if you hear all this, you know, God here, and God there, and God everywhere, after a while you think, oh my God. <laughs> uh, too much, a little too much God here. Uh, you know, an overdose, right? It's like just we heard this word now, this G-O-D word. We heard it so many times now. It's a bit much for the mind. Um, um, I might have thought like that. I, I remember that once one of our Indian sannyasis uh, came here and did a program in Holland and they rented a hall in Artis in Amsterdam and you know, and then there was, at first they sang, and then he said to all the Dutch people, and now I all want you to fold your hands and pray. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> they're, they're not going to like that. That's too much for them, too direct. And to my surprise, they all did it. I mean, but I'm not an Indian Swami, so if I asked, then they will uh, 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 uh. <laughs> yeah. So I won't ask. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this is a Vaishnava. A Vaishnava is, is acting like a well-wisher. So the Vaishnava has become our ideal. It's the ideal person who is uh, projected by the Bhagavad Gita, our role model, the person that we are striving for. Uh, there are three modes of nature in the material world. Goodness, passion, and ignorance. Right. Places in goodness, places in passion, places in ignorance, are covered in dirt, uh, foul smell, Places in passion is where, you know, everybody is trying to squeeze out a few more drops of enjoyment or, you know, like make some good investment so we score and get, make some progress. Passion. 
a goodness, peaceful, thoughtful, reflective, food in goodness, uh, food in goodness is that which gives health, it's sustaining, it's fresh, vegetarian. Foods in passion, flames shoot out of the mouth and the ears. And, oh, good stuff. <sighs> <laughs> Got some more of that. <laughs> Gives you a kick. <laughs> yeah. uh, food and ignorance is sort of like... It's, it's, how long has this been in the fridge? <laughs> can't remember when did they put it in there. Was it last week, Monday, or the week before? <laughs> anyway, stick it in the microwave. <laughs> zap, 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 ping! <laughs> yummy, yummy. <laughs> Tasty food in ignorance. So, like this. The three modes of material nature are all around us. Goodness, passion and ignorance. And that's not all. They're also inside of us. Oh, yes. And sometimes inside of us is not the same as what is outside of us. Sometimes outside all goodness and we are in passion. Oh my God, this drives me nuts here, you know. Amen. If, suppose you are in passion internally and the place is in goodness. A beautiful lake with a swan and you're in the forest and you sit there and you're in passion you it's like God you know let's see if the thing can fly <laughs> throw, a, throw a stone at him you know, get some action something going you know yeah? you see you get the idea so it's interesting how these modes of nature are within us and without us and they're not always synchronized uh, not always so anyway, uh, gradually, uh, it is said, according to the mode that one has attained, one will also have, have a certain faith. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the mode of passion, money, and money is the honey, goes well with the mode of passion. You know? Money, money, money is the honey. <laughs> You can see the idea. Yeah. So, it is said that people and places are afflicted by the three modes of nature. One must associate with goodness. If we associate with goodness, then we become peaceful. So we must be in a peaceful place. You can't live in a madhouse, you become mad. Yeah. If you live in a bar, what's going to become of you? Come or drink only orange juice. Come on, come on, have some tequila in that orange juice. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't be squared. Come on. Tequila sunrise. Yeah, come on, come on. Come on. It's good for the germs. Yeah. Yeah. Good for the blood. Yeah. No more real, no. You know. Just a little. Yeah. Medicinal purposes. <laughs> In the tea. Uh, so, that is... It takes time. It takes time to get out of the lower modes. The whole... We grew up in the lower modes. That's just what happened to us. We grew up in passion and ignorance so much. It came into our life. Uh, it was spoon-fed, yeah? and little by little, it just became part of our life. Millions of little things, actually, all together. Millions of little attachments. Oh, and all these little attachments all together bind us in so many things, and they block us. So first, purification. Purification is the program. So Bhagavad Gita offers us a program of purification. Abhyasi yogi yuktena chitasana nyagamina paramam purusham divyam yati partan sindhya. And one must practice this. That's yoga. yoga. That's actually yoga. You know. Uh, 
Do you have a yoga mat? I do. Do you use your yoga mat? Yeah. Yeah? I don't. <laughs> like most people. I bought one and I go on it once a year when I swear to myself I'm going to start again. I stumble over the thing and say, God, I still have that yoga mat. <laughs> I should do some yoga. Uh, and touch your toes with the tip of your nose and all these kind of things. Uh, it reminds me, see, my mother, she was into gymnastics that before yoga was invented. They had, before they had yoga, they had gymnastics. And there was, the radio was big in those days, you know. So my mother always had the radio in. And there were on and there was this piano playing plunk 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 and then this horrible voice, you know, a voice I couldn't stand. And bend your knees <laughs> all on the rhythm of the music music, you know, so I'm still a little allergic to yoga. <laughs> when it comes to bending and when it comes to all these things, I must admit. But then when I found out that yoga is not at all that, what a relief. <laughs> yoga is more than that. Yoga is an outlook. Yoga is, is a mentality. It's not gymnastics at all. It's about a mentality and these yoga asanas are simply meant to bring, out, bring about another state of consciousness. To, it's not about, you know, physical fitness or be stress-free, although stress-free seems to go a little closer to the mode of goodness. It's about that, about coming to the mode of goodness and then making the jump, the jump to the spiritual platform, because then you can maintain it. Otherwise, you know, on the 31st <coughs> December, I swear, I will never, and on the 3rd of January, it's all over again. It's so hard to maintain such things, uh, these ideals. Therefore, purification, therefore a process, yoga, a change of consciousness, an alteration, and then, then one can become spiritually anchored. And then, suddenly, uh, then we can go beyond believing then we can go to experience, to perceiving. Then we can break through to the other side. Yeah. Other side, other side. Um, we can go into perceive that other dimension, yeah. that other reality that now we can't see. We can only, yeah, people have ideas about it. But then we perceive. So this purification, this inner alteration, is required. So that one can only do, uh, that one can only do, if one uh, takes guidance from a Vaishnava. Just like there are a few yoga teachers here in the room. I, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> a couple, you know. <laughs> There's a couple of them. <laughs> They're all on the same side of the room. <laughs> anyway, um, nothing against yoga teachers. <laughs> um, no, uh, the point is, it's easier when you have a yoga teacher. It's easier. It's easier. And if you have to do it all alone, you know, it's easier to do it with a few other people. If you have to do it alone with an app on your phone, <laughs> you know. I'd rather have a most. Anyway, uh, back to uh, my main point. Uh, my main point is, so, the Bhagavad Gita describes us a process through which we gradually have an alteration of consciousness and then transcendental perception begins. And then you come to that stage where Jung maybe was from I know, I know. And then if you take it further from then and you begin to sacrifice your life right, 
for Krishna, for the Supreme, then you can learn to love. And that's really our aim. Right? That's our goal. So we're looking today at the Vaishnava as a role model. Srila uh, Prabhupada is the embodiment of the Vaishnava. We uh, are aspiring to be Vaishnavas and make mistakes on the way, but still keep on aspiring. And therefore, we invite uh, the world to, uh, to look at this. You know, we need a new era. It's a shame that nothing happened on the 21st of December. <laughs> Another letdown, you know. I was really hoping something's going to happen. I, s I didn't see the full movie, but you know, the 2012 one. But I did see the trailer, and you know, I saw the Saint Peter's fall over, and like volcanoes burst out, and, a, and a, an aircraft carrier being thrown on the uh, the Capitol building in Washington. It looked really good. Uh, <laughs> So I was hoping that we're going to have an interesting Christmas, but <laughs> it was boring again, <laughs> like every other year. No drastic changes. Mm. And now it's 2013. God, definitely not 12. Huh? What are we going to think of now? Someone said he made the wrong calculation. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, whatever they say. Um, as far as I'm concerned, 2012 was a good year. It was a good year because in that year there was devotional service. We tried to serve Krishna. So that made it good. The rest of the year, well, you know, but because we served Krishna, it was a good year. And 2013 is going to be better. Why? Because all the service we did in 2012 will stay. The benefit will stay. And whatever we do in 2030 adds up to that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, 2013 will be better than 2012. And 2014 better than 2013. Can't wait for, you know, 220. <laughs> Let's go. So in this way, that's the nice thing. Um, that when one takes up spiritual life... Um, it is, it is sobhagya. It makes everything auspicious. All right. Uh, that is basically what I um, wanted to share with you. It is the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita in a nutshell. And pointing out that we need, we need to connect. To become a devotee, we need to connect to a devotee. To become a Vaishnav, we must connect to a Vaishnava alone. It's like my yoga mat. You know. <laughs> alone. It's hard to maintain. Mm. She sells yoga mats. That's why she smiles. So much. <laughs> <laughs> it's her business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope it was all right. You all came from, from far, and uh, many of you. Some came from Sweden, some came from Croatia, some came from Germany, and, you know, some came from all the way from the other side of Amsterdam, some came from <laughs> the cook from North Holland, and Den uh, Haag and Rotterdam, and uh, yeah, like that many places. Um, maybe there was someone who was here for the first time today and uh, uh, maybe some things were just uh, hard to grasp. Uh, I can appreciate that. It is like that. Uh, uh, but what we see here is a culture. Uh, it's not Although the, the place is humble and simple, uh, what we're seeing is a culture which is prevalent around the world. Um, 
it's not just a handful of people. It's um, there are millions of people in India. Uh, in fact, I saw a number somewhere the other day that there are uh, in India, roughly speaking, 200 million people who would uh, who are aspiring to be Vaishnavas. 200 million. And there's a few here also. So, we're not alone. So therefore, uh, I think it's a relevant topic if there are 200 million people in the world population who are in India alone and then around the world more people are blind, are aspiring to be a Vaishnava. Then I think it's a good topic to discuss. Who is a Vaishnava? And that's my question. Uh, who is a Vaishnava? And I wish to become one. Thank you so much. Now, a few more minutes, if there's a question or two, then we'll try and answer them also. You were talking about the parents which we, we choose, they are like us, likewise, to trust the Lord itself, the same as us, the parents. Like-minded. Uh, Like-minded. Uh, do you mean it is that we always make a decision, a, a, a conscious choice? No, I, it's not that we choose them, we are, are drawn to that, like magnetic force. Okay. The consciousness of, that our parents have is just pulling us in. So, so we are somewhere on the wavelength, the same one. Maybe that doesn't mean that every child is completely in the same mood as his parents. Oh no, some kids, I, they just, they, they just hate their parents, uh, well, not when they're very small, but <coughs> when they grow up, they, they really develop the thing where they feel very, very different from their parents and so on, and feel like, I've been born in the wrong family. No, but they had, they had an issue with that same mood, yeah? That's, like, you know, let's say, <coughs> uh, I was born in, Heimstede. And Heimstede has the lowest crime rate of the Netherlands. Yeah, it's like Haarlem is the safest city, and then Heimstede is more safe than Haarlem. Nothing ever happens in Heimstede. <laughs> Nothing. It just doesn't. It, it just doesn't. Yeah? It doesn't. Yeah? Nothing, ever. Nothing. So it's the most also, from my perspective, at one point, the most boring place in the universe. <laughs> Nothing ever happens in Heimstead. So at one point, I really felt like, I've got to get out of this place. Right? There must be more in the world than Heimstead, where everything is clean, everything is neat, everything is nice, everyone has a picket fence, and everyone says very politely, good morning to everybody, and nobody raises his voice, and everything is just as it should be. <laughs> you would like it there, wouldn't you? <laughs> Maybe your next life you can take <laughs> Yeah, so it, so it, I was there, but it, it, at one point I, get, I had to get out. But somehow or other, that's, that was the right fit, you know. And I took birth in Holland, you know, but I never lived in Holland much. Yeah? I mean, only my childhood, and then I left. When I was 17, I left. Yeah? And, you know, I always felt like Holland is so small. And so full with people, you, you know, and therefore you can't do anything here. You can't even park your car, because yeah? there's too many cars. 
Yeah. It took you half an hour to find a parking today, if if not more. And that's Holland, you know, and it's like everywhere it's full. There's a guy in an office who knows exactly how many wild boars there are on the Veluwe. <laughs> and he decides that. You know, he decides that. The Veluwe is a big forest. Uh, the only big one we have, 50 square kilometers, excuse me, uh, on the German border. Uh, big, huh? <laughs> and we have wild boars. But there's a man in an office, I read this, yes. there's a man in an office and he decides how many wild boars there are and that's how many there are. <laughs> Isn't that shocking? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, things like that make me feel like I've got to get out of this place. <laughs> I want somewhere where life is natural and a little bigger, a little more space. And, you know, it's not only physically no space, you have an idea in Holland, and there are 20 million people with ideas, and if you have an idea, someone else is in your space already doing that idea. <laughs> That's Holland. Therefore, it's a suffocating country. And therefore, Anyway, that's my, my personal opinion now. It's not... And that's why I felt I didn't feel at home. But I took birth here. And there is something Dutch in me, you know. Yeah. Um, look toward a miracle, right? I will struggle and emerge, you know. I have it in me. Yeah. It's part of my nature. Yeah. Like the ik worstel en kom boven. Uh, I've got it. <laughs> Je m'en tiendrai. Oh. Can I ask you something? Yes. And then you're very idealistic about India. Then you come to India, yeah. where people, um, uh, or where here, you say in Holland, they decide how many animals on value, right? Yeah. Then you come to India, and they, dis they decide for ages that. Uh, Women are less than the men. Oh. And, uh, yeah. yeah, excuse me. No, no, that's they fine. decided for <laughs> ages that uh, uh, yeah. I, I, uh, you don't have television, but I do. Huh? That you, you don't have. You, you, you don't look television, but I do. Yeah. And I saw a shocking documentary about India yeah. Yeah. months ago. Yeah. Old, wom old Indian women yeah. uh, telling that she murdered seven girls. Oh. She gave birth to girls, and oh. because it's girl, she murdered them yeah. because it's not a boy. Yeah. And uh, yesterday was uh, on the news that all the old Sikh and Indian uh, yeah. kind of guru, uh, uh, old yeah. uh, men yeah. uh, say uh, girls not allowed to yeah. take telephones to uh, they, they have to. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, but yeah. What, what do I'm I saying, think about? What I'm that? saying? No, I want to, oh. to know how because you are speaking so idyllic about yeah, yeah. India. Yeah, yeah. And no, so good. negative good about Holland. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's true. Now, India, you know, uh, is uh, young. Uh, when I spoke about Holland, I said, like, it's just a material, that was a material thing. Um, about India, the only thing I like about India is the spirituality. There's another side of India which I hate, and that's, you know, so India is a love-hate. I was, I lived in India for a long time, and I, I just literally hate the filth, I hate the disease, I hate the, uh, the, the misinterpretation of, of spiritual knowledge in India. Uh, I, really, I don't like the exploitation of it. So there's many things in India that are wrong, as much as they are in the whole world, right? Because in, it is now the age of Kali, the age of, um, of materialism, the age of exploitation. So now, in every country, it's the same. So India has a tradition, and in the tradition, there is good knowledge, but it has been covered by someone's misunderstanding. Just like, you know, here, the church, right? If, now, if you look in Europe at the church, uh, the church in itself came with an enlightened message. But then in the name of the church, so many people were burned on the stake and God knows what else. So in the same way in India, you know? 
So, when you're looking at the external atrocities, uh, the wrong things, ah, you know, you are very right. But at the core, there is some deep knowledge there. And, and that what I said about the faith that lives in the people, that's really there, you know. I have seen people in India right, who, who lost everything and who were not broken. They, were, they lost everything. You know, you can, a human being can lose practically, but they were not broken. They still, they were still strong and, and still going on and have an inner acceptance. And there, so there is piety. That was my point. No, I, I don't think India is ideal at all. <laughs> I also have had heavy experiences in India. Not so much. Nice. So, I'm not idealizing India and making Holland black. But Holland is nice, but for me it was too small. That's all. I, I just spoke in response to her question about the birth, you know. You take birth in a place. Um, how you get attracted to a place because of your karma, you, 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 you belong in that place. So, for a while I belonged here, that's all. Any other? Or otherwise we finish up. Okay, yes. Uh, it's a very simple and practical question. I like how it. Does, <laughs> how does the soul connect to the body when, when, uh -huh. when the child is conceived? Yes. Well, it's not like uh, it. It connects. Um, it can, it first connects to the parents <coughs> through desire. There is a certain amount of desire in the consciousness of of the soul. Uh, <coughs> the soul that is not in a body now is driven by desire. That desire brings the living being to a certain situation, then enters into that body by, des by the desire to enjoy the material energy, and then also stays in the body because of the desire to enjoy the material energy. So the binding force is the desire to enjoy the material energy. Yeah. That's what keeps us in the body. So it's not like a physical, you know, and then suddenly, like a vacuum cleaner, the body just sucks up the soul and then it's in the bag, you know, the soul is in the bag. <laughs> no, it's not like that. It comes by desire. What well, do you think? Then why, uh, as a man, well, contraception is considered immoral. Why is this? Consider it more. Um, well, because you are basically um, the idea of con contraception is that we'll have sex for the sake of enjoying sex life, and enjoying sex life will make you more and more attached to the body. So that will bind you more and more to a. Uh, birth after birth in the material energy. Therefore, it is not recommended for one who wants to become self-realized. If you want to become self-realized, then you say, uh, yes, if you engage in sexuality, then also then conceive the children. And in there, your lust gets transformed. See? Sex is based on lust, but in having children, your lust becomes transformed into sacrifice. And that's the natural process. So in the natural process, lust becomes transformed into sacrifice. Well, wait, wait till you have a kid. Phew. You know, or a dozen. Um, a lot of sacrifice. So, uh, but if, you, if it's this contraception, then it's only lust. And that lust will just increase and increase, and then people become more and more selfish. Yeah. Therefore, it's immoral or not acceptable, because it makes people more and more selfish. Whew. Okay, in a long sit.
I have to stretch my legs. No, and you too. Yoga. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. But I was, I was two days ago. I was in Africa, and it was 37 degrees, and now it's below zero. So I feel really stiff in the cold. Change. <laughs> I don't think it's just yoga. That I think it's 37 degrees down. <laughs> yeah. I'm free. Anyway, I'm turning it over to you. To, uh, there will be a little singing and dancing and then they'll serve out the feast. Thank you very much for being with us and hope to see you again. All right. Peace. Yeah. 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 Yeah.